Welcome back. This is the final part of cell biology. We covered plasma membrane proteins and we were talking about the functions of plasma membrane proteins. And this was the final function, the generation and maintenance of resting membrane potential. So here we're going to still pull some of those concepts that we've talked about together in terms of transport and ions and gradients. So it'll help to consolidate what we did in the last part as well. There's quite a long list of things you may notice there, but that's just because I've, I've broken it down quite a lot. And as you will find throughout the module, where we go over some things again, you've already been over them once. So we're only adding a little bit of information. It just looks worse than it is. So enjoy resting membrane potential. In order to talk about resting membrane potentials, we need to talk about membrane potentials. So an electrical potential generally refers to the potential difference in electrical charge between two points in an electrical field. So we're talking about a difference between two places. It's expressed generally as voltage. In the human body, we measure it as millivolts, because obviously if it wasn't millivolts, we'd be electrocuted. A membrane potential refers to the voltage, so the difference in electrical charge, across the plasma membrane. This is our two points in an electrical field, inside the membrane, outside the membrane. So it is localized to the membrane only. If the membrane potential is comparatively negative inside the membrane and positive outside, it is a minus figure. So an example might be minus 40 millivolts. And here in the diagram, you can see I've got more positives outside than I have inside, more minuses inside than I have outside. At zero, the electrical potential would be equalized, zero millivolts, and there would be the same charge either side. So I'd have equal number of pluses and minuses either side of the plasma membrane. If the membrane potential is comparatively positive inside the membrane and negative outside, it is a plus figure. So an example might be plus 40 millivolts. Note the minus and the plus. You have to use the minus and the plus to indicate which side of zero we are. And in this diagram at the bottom, I've got lots more minuses outside and pluses inside. So this is plus millivolts. The diagram above where I've got more pluses outside is minus millivolts. There are three types of potential in terms of the human body. The resting membrane potential that we're going to talk about occurs in all cells. And it's really important for maintaining the ionic and osmotic or hydrostatic equilibrium in the cell. The inside of the plasma membrane is negatively charged compared to the outside. The plasma membrane in this scenario is said to be polarized. The average RMP varies from cell to cell. So an excitable cell, so excitable cells, we're talking about irritable cells, we're talking about neurons or myocytes who conduct, both of those cells conduct action potentials along their membranes. So in neurons, the RMP average is about minus 70 millivolts. In myocytes, it is minus 90 millivolts. In non-excitable cells, so in epithelial cells that don't conduct action potentials, it's about minus 20 millivolts. So if you think about it, that's, that's quite a bit closer there to zero.
generally other non-excitable cells average around minus 40 millivolts. So in RMP, we're talking all minus figures. In minus figures, if you think about it, the larger the figure, the further away it is from zero millivolts. An action potential is the nerve impulse. So this is the thing that occurs along the membrane of excitable cells, such as neurons, muscle cells, and also some glandular cells. In this scenario, the inside of the membrane becomes briefly positive compared to the outside. It is briefly depolarized. So this is where we go over the other side of zero millivolts and we go to plus figures. Graded potentials are localized changes in the membrane potential. And this could involve depolarization or even hyperpolarization. You'll understand more about that after we've done neurophysiology. The RMP is generated by ionic movement across the plasma membrane, which is logical, isn't it? Those, those are the things that we know carry a charge, whether that charge be positive or negative, and depending where those charges are. So ions generate resting membrane potential. Generation of resting membrane potential involves passive transport via ion channels. But that doesn't mean to say those ion channels for specific ions involved in this are open. Therefore, we could say that generation of RMP involves electrical, chemical and electrochemical gradients because this is what drives passive transport. It also involves selective and differential permeability. So it's determined by the gradients moving the ions, but also by whether those channels are open or closed. Remember, electrical gradients involve opposite charges of charged solutes, whether they be ions, molecules, or whatever, attracting each other. Chemical gradients involve specific chemicals, regardless of charge, moving or wanting to move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. An electrochemical gradient, remember, has to operate in the same direction. So this is when we have both a, an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient are causing a solute to move or want to move in the same direction. Permeability, we talked about being selective. So this is about channels or transporters being specific for an ion or solute. This is the what. And permeability can be differential. This is the when. Channels can be open or closed depending on stimulation of their gating mechanisms. And if you remember, we talked about gating, we talked about ligand gated channels, we talked about voltage gated channels and mechanically gated channels. So generation of the resting membrane potential. Every cell contains negatively charged proteins and phosphates. So remember, we made all those proteins, a lot of those carry a negative charge. Phosphates carry a negative charge, and we've said there's plenty of free phosphates floating around within the cytosol. They don't have any transport mechanisms. They're, they're stuck within the cell, basically, and they're carrying a negative charge. We've also got intracellular chlorine. Chlorine is an anion. It carries a negative charge. 
So these negatively charged proteins and phosphates and also the chlorine contribute to intracellular negativity. So the inside of the cell naturally has a bit of a negative charge compared to outside because of these proteins, phosphates and chlorine. Sodium, if you remember from your pre-reading, is mainly in the extracellular compartment. So it's of a much higher concentration extracellularly compared to intracellularly. So as a chemical, it is a higher concentration outside compared to inside. Therefore, it's going to want to follow its chemical gradient into the cell from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. In addition to this, because of these negative proteins, phosphates and chlorine that we've just talked about, it also wants to follow its electrical gradient into the cell. Because sodium is positively charged, it's attracted to a negative area. So it wants to follow both its chemical gradient and its electrical gradient and move into the cell. It wants to influx. Influx is a really good short word for moving, for saying that it wants to enter the cell. So sodium, we can say, wants to follow its electrochemical gradient, both in the same direction, and influx. In other words, enter the cell. However, sodium channels are closed. So here we go with permeability. Sodium channels are closed. Because they're closed, sodium accumulates on the outside of the plasma membrane. This is going to make the extracellular surface of the membrane positive compared to the intracellular. So it's all clustering around the membrane, clustering around those closed channels, wanting desperately to follow its electrochemical gradient into the cell, but it can't. We look at that in a diagram. Because of the intracellular negatively charged proteins, phosphates and chlorine, there they are in the middle, sodium wants to influx following its electrical gradient. Because of a higher extracellular concentration, and there you can see we're talking about 15 millimoles per litre within the cell compared to 150 millimoles per litre outside the cell, it wants to influx following its chemical gradient. It wants to influx, therefore, following its electrochemical gradient because it's following, wants to follow an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient. We can put those two words together, electrochemical gradient, same direction. But it can't because the sodium channels are closed. Because of that, it accumulates on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane, desperate to try and get in. OK, so potassium is our other iron involved. In this case, in terms of permeability, the potassium channels are mostly open. So the membrane is permeable to potassium. So it can influx, move into the cell, 1F. It can also efflux, move out of the cell, with two Fs. Influx in, efflux out. So K plus, of course, is a cation. Same as sodium, it's a cation. So therefore, it's also drawn by this electrical gradient. So we have the negative phosphates and chlorine still trapped inside the cell. So potassium influxes following the electrical gradient caused by those negative phosphates and proteins. 
its channels are open, so it does influx. However, in terms of concentration, it's the opposite of sodium. There is a much higher chemical concentration of potassium within the cell compared to outside the cell. Therefore, the chemical gradient for potassium, and remember chemical gradients are specific to the chemical, the chemical gradient for potassium is making it want to efflux. And of course, the channels are open, so it does efflux. So it effluxes following its chemical gradient from a high area of high concentration of potassium to an area of lower concentration of potassium. So it's influxing following its electrical gradient and it's effluxing following its chemical gradient. So because of these opposing gradients, one potassium influxes following the electrical gradient. If you always start with the electrical gradient because you can remember, hopefully, about those negative phosphates and proteins and chlorine within the cell. They're trapped there. They're, they're there regardless. So think about the electrical gradient. First, of course, potassium is positive. It's going to influx following the electrical gradient because opposite charges attract. So one potassium influxes following the electrical gradient. For every one potassium that effluxes comes out following its chemical gradient because, of course, the concentration is so much higher inside the cell, it wants to move from an area of a high concentration to a lower concentration. So we have equilibrium of movement. Because potassium channels are open, we get one potassium influx for every one potassium efflux. Influx due to the electrical gradient, efflux due to its chemical gradient. We cannot call that an electrochemical gradient because they're in opposite directions. It has to be in the same direction for it to be called electrochemical. So let's look at our diagram for that. So as we said, potassium channels are open. Because of the intracellular negatively charged proteins, phosphates and chlorine, potassium follows its electrical gradient and influxes because of that positive charge being attracted to the negative charge inside the cell. Because of a lower extracellular concentration, it effluxes following its chemical gradient. And you can see the difference there. It's even greater than sodium, but in the other direction. So here we've got five millimoles per litre in the extracellular compartment compared to 150 millimoles per litre inside. So one potassium influxes following the electrical gradient for every one potassium that effluxes following its chemical gradient, electrical in, chemical out. And that generates the resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential is generated when you have intracellular negatively charged phosphates and proteins. You have Na plus sodium accumulated on the extracellular surface. You have equal movement of potassium, one in, one out. Electrical in, chemical out. And these characteristics make the outside of the membrane more positive than the inside. And this is the point that we have generated resting membrane potential. So, okay, we've generated it. So why do we need our second part? Why do we need to maintain resting membrane potential? Well, the problem is we've got these leak channels or leakage channels. 
And because sodium is on the outside of the cell, accumulated around the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane, pushing to get in, it exerts a constant electrochemical gradient pressure on the outside of the plasma membrane. And eventually, it starts to leak through these leakage channels. The leakage channels are specific for cations. So potassium could also leak out through these channels. But it happens, of course, to a much lesser extent because it's got counteracting gradients and it's got open channels. Sodium, on the other hand, has this huge need to follow its electrochemical gradient and get into the cell. So it tends to leak through the leakage channels. And this is a constant thing going on. If we allowed it to happen, it would increase the intracellular positive charge and it would destroy resting membrane potential. As a result, we would have a change in the ionic balance. We would also have a change in the osmotic balance, ultimately leading to lysis because wherever sodium goes, water will follow because it's an osmotic particle. So sodium would leak in. If we didn't remove it, water would eventually decide, oh, I'm going in too. Gradually, the cell would swell with water. And potentially, in the end, it would burst. This is lysis, bursting cell. So as it leaks in, we need to get it back out again. So we have to move it back out of the cell and here we're moving it against its chemical gradient. So we need active transport. In addition, in other cells, in excitable cells, of course, when you have an action potential, what you do is you move a lot of sodium into the inside of the membrane and you move potassium out. So you have to correct that after the action potential in order to restore resting membrane potential. But in all cells, you have this problem of leakage. So, okay, maintenance of resting membrane potential, we said this is active transport. It involves the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And you write that as I've written it there, Na plus stroke K plus ATPase pump. We need active transport because we're going to transport these ions against gradients. Therefore, the pump has to have ATPase. In order to hydrolyze ATP and release that energy for the pump, it has to have the enzyme to hydrolyze ATP. So ATP is hydrolyzed by ATPase on the pump to provide energy. The energy is then used to change the shape of the pump. So originally, in that first picture, it's open to the inside of the cell. The change in shape changes it so that it's open to the outside of the cell. So if you say that it has a change of shape, a conformational change, posh way of saying change of shape, you have to say how it changes. A conformational change, a change in shape, it could turn into anything. So it opens to the outside of the plasma membrane. Now the pump, when it's open to the inside, it exposes three high affinity intracellular binding sites for sodium. And open to the inside is its sort of default state, if you like. 
When it opens to the outside, though, it exposes two high affinity extracellular binding sites for potassium. So we've got three intracellular binding sites for sodium, two extracellular binding sites for potassium. So consequently, our pump can pump three sodium out and two potassium in. Note we're not using the term influx and efflux here. That's really to do with passive transport. Here we're talking about things being transported or pumped. A lot more active, more positive than efflux and influx. Efflux and influx apply, applies really to passive transport. The pump pumps three sodium out and two potassium in. So let's start at the beginning. Our sodium, remember, leaks in following that strong electrochemical gradient via leak channels. As it leaks in, Oh, it thinks, oh, great, I've got into the cell. That's lovely. Oh, look, there's a lovely binding site for me. Remember we talked about affinity. High affinity means that those binding sites are very, very attractive to whatever binds to them. So the sodium that's got into the cell is highly attracted to these binding sites. So it goes off and it binds to these binding sites on the pump. Once three of them have done this, so all those binding sites fill up, ATPase on the pump hydrolyzes ATP. Obviously, that's going to leave ADP and P, but more importantly, it provides the pump with energy. That breaking of that final high energy bond between the last two phosphates releases energy for the pump. In addition, the pump is phosphorylated. Now, it might not be that phosphate that we've just released. It might be any old phosphate. But a phosphate also binds to the pump. So we've got energy and phosphorylation of the pump. ATP hydrolysis provides the energy for the pump to change shape. Phosphorylation really acts a bit like a switch. It's a bit like um, electricity. You turn a light on, your energy is electricity, but you need a switch to activate it. So the phosphate is acting a bit like a switch. So once the pump, it's got its three sodium bound to those high affinity binding sites. It's got energy from the hydrolysis of the ATP and it's been phosphorylated. The pump undergoes this conformational change whereby it opens extracellularly. As I say, you, you can't just say it undergoes a conformational change. It could turn into a rabbit. In this case, it's opening extracellularly, opening to the outside of the cell by changing shape. Once it's done that, the sodium is released back into the extracellular environment and basically moved out of the cell. Of course, the sodium is going to go clustering around the membrane again and try and get through another leak channel, but never mind, we got rid of three. So once the pump has released its three sodium, it's now open extracellularly. And what it's done is exposed to high affinity potassium binding sites. It's still got its phosphate, still open extracellularly. And now it's got two high affinity potassium binding sites exposed. So two extracellular 
potassium now bind to the pump. Once they bind, it triggers dephosphorylation of the pump. Phosphorylation was the, the phosphate going on. Dephosphorylation is it coming off. So the pump, once the two potassium bind, dephosphorylates. Once that happens, it triggers the pump to go back to its original shape, its original conformation, which was open intracellularly, open to the inside of the cell. So it's switched back to its default position at the release of the phosphate. Now the two potassium are released from the pump back into the cell. Of course, once the pump has released its two potassium, off we go again if there's some sodium that's snuck in meanwhile. So the pump is now open intracellularly. Three more sodium that have leaked in meanwhile can bind. And as soon as three of them have bound, the pump will repeat the process using ATP again, phosphorylating again, opening to the outside, binding to potassium, opening to the inside once it's dephosphorylated. So that will keep on going as long as sodium is leaking in and binding to the pump. So as long as there is sodium in the cell, the pump will continue to remove it. Excitable cells have lots of these pumps on their, in their membranes because during an action potential, a lot of sodium is allowed to influx and a lot of potassium effluxes. So this gives the opportunity to restore resting membrane potential as quickly as possible after an action potential. Although generally, as I said, other cells, you've got this constant leak of sodium anyway. So that was the end of cell biology. That's our first topic of seven. We will move on next time to tissues and muscle. Make sure before we do that, that you have got the all of cell biology written up in your own notes, your own diagrams and as much as possible you've learnt the content. And I'll see you at your live session before we move on to the next topic.